Hello and welcome to this video on what salt does in bread, a surprisingly important ingredient for some very odd reasons. In a world where salt is the enemy of good health, you might want to forgo the pinch of salt in bread, but while a sound health decision, it isn't necessarily a good baking decision. The salt does a few important things in bread, and the first two are fairly straightforward and don't require a great deal of explanation. To begin with, we have flavour. The bread is, to be blunt about it, kind of bland without just a pinch of salt. It helps to bring out some of the flavours that are just not there otherwise. Now, you can do it, it's certainly true, but, well, why make bread less appealing than it has to be? The other thing is that it tends to round out the flavour in that respect. It makes up for the slight changes that yeast has to play. The other important thing it does is that it, to a certain extent, inhibits yeast. It slows down the way it behaves just enough that you get a nice bread dough and not a nice fermentation. The fermentation in this case being specifically separate from the general understanding of it. It means that you have time for the bread to rise, you don't just have the yeast multiplying without any other considerations. That means your bread is light, you have a crust that's nice and set, and it's a little bit crumbly. Whereas if it just fermented, it would gradually turn into a goop. If you were thinking, well, if a little bit of yeast is good, surely more is better. And yes, to a point, you can certainly increase the amount of salt, and it will slow down the fermentation process somewhat. This gives more time for the CO2 bubbles to cause the bread to rise, which can be useful particularly with things like sourdough. That will allow you to have a more pronounced flavour, and somewhat more complex tasting bread and the various other features we've already described. The other side to that though is if you go too far down adding the salt, it'll actually not ferment properly as the salt will directly inhibit the yeast to an excessive degree. This will lead to bread that's just not good. It'll either be really dense, it'll have basically no structure to it, and it won't have any of the flavours that you particularly want. The other thing that salt does, other than regulating yeast to some extent, either by allowing it to slow down just enough to be useful, or in bad case, slow down too much, it instead helps to alter the structure of the gluten within the dough. Now most of the time, gluten has a pretty major role in ensuring that everything is held together. It's kind of like elasticated bands being used to tie something together. It pulls it in and keeps it tight. Admittedly, if it's too tight, your bread doesn't taste very good and doesn't have a good mouthfeel. If it's not present enough, well, you get basically gluten-free bread, and when that happens, everybody is sad. By having the salt sort of hydrate the gluten protein, you can sort of break it down, but not break it down as a whole, but rather into slightly shorter sections. That means that while it's not as intact, it's still intact enough to work properly and ensure that the gluten can provide the necessary stretch and structure for air bubbles and the various textures you want within your bread. One way it does this is that the salt, once it's in the bread, mix the dough. It will help to hold on to some of the water for a little bit longer, ensuring that the gluten proteins have just that little bit of delay. Once it does start to break up, and it interacts with the gluten proteins on a much larger scale, it helps to a certain extent by ensuring that those somewhat broken up strands have a, a very weak but extensive connection across the entire loaf. This ensures that the loaf can stretch. While stretching up to a point, it will then break as the bonds that the salt provides aren't able to hold after a certain amount of forces applied. We also have, again, bringing back the idea of moisture, but the salt will help to a certain extent to absorb moisture. Now this can be useful if you want to have flavours within your bread be slightly more mobile. The moisture that's attached to the salt will be able to essentially act as a sort of a sponge that will absorb the tastes, aromas and so on in your food and this will allow for the food to better carry that taste and aroma. The salt also being one of the more basic taste sensations. The next thing that salt will do is that it will alter the colour of the crust of your bread dough. 
when you bake with bread dough and that's got relatively little salt in it, you find that they don't get as browned. You just don't get the Maillard reaction. Whereas if you add just a little bit of salt, you get this occurring. The salt is necessary for the Maillard reaction to occur properly. You may also recognize the Maillard reaction as simply being called caramelization. And caramel does undergo something very similar, but not quite the same. As such, salt is needed for a good Maillard reaction to occur. In terms of the rising, we've mentioned the role that salt has to play with gluten and in delaying yeast fermenting. But the other thing it does is that it seems to make it possible for bread to rise more. And by more we mean literally get taller. This is made up in part by that stronger dough structure with the interaction of gluten and salt, the gas being produced and so on. But there are other things again that seem to be contributing to it as you can adjust these things and still get differing results so long as you add the salt, but the salt seems to be a defining factor. Another thing salt does, and it's why it's very common in commercial bread, is that it keeps bread fresh. Whether we're talking about the retention of moisture so you don't get dry bread, assuming you don't want to make toast, the, uh, the starch doesn't recrystallize, and it has a very, very small role to play as an antimicrobial. Remember, you're not adding a lot of salt, so the role it plays in that respect is not a great deal. What it does do, even in that small amount, is to control enzymes. Enzymes are present in a variety of ways, and just about all flour will have some to some extent. For example, you have amylases, although they're unlikely to be available in a large quantity, but there are other kinds in the flours that are used as well. And so salt, due to the nature of what it is, can either turn on, turn off, or semi-inhibit various enzymes. The final thing to consider is, if you're going to be adding salt, just which salt are you going to use? Now, there are going to be various recommendations out there. These will be things like, say, kosher salt, or you might be told to use a certain, say, Himalayan salt, pink salt, or other rock salts. And the choice will depend considerably on what you're trying to do. General rule of thumb is that it's best to use fine grain salts, for example, table salt. The reason you want to do this is that it will more easily dissolve into your bread dough and it will distribute more evenly. A coarse salt, like for example, kosher salt, salt flakes, or even uh, those various colored salts that are out there, may provide you with nice bright colors when they're first added, but they will eventually dissolve and they, uh, well, to be blunt about it, there will be a pocket of surprise you may not want. Biting down into a sandwich or bread for any other reason, and suddenly finding that you're chewing on salt rocks isn't fun. On top of the bread loaf as a purely decorative flourish, sure, that makes sense, but internally, not so much. The flavours themselves are another factor to consider here. As a general rule, different salts will affect in different ways. One thing that defines kosher salt is the absence of any iodine present. The table salt often is similar. Various other salts will carry their own flavors again, depending on what they are. So just be aware that adding a flavored salt may in fact alter the flavor of the bread to a considerable degree. Assuming that whatever recipe you're looking at doesn't specify a type of salt to use, it's generally best to use something like a table salt or possibly kosher salt. We'll get more onto the role of iodine shortly, but just understand that unless they specify otherwise, those are your best options. Unless you're trying to adjust the flavor a particular way, in which case you want to choose your salt accordingly. One thing that is, let's say, useful, particularly in terms of most modern salt now, is that most salt now is fortified with iodine. This is beneficial in a variety of ways, since most of the world seems to have a relative lack of iodine present. Now, it's true that various objections are raised to iodine, and most of these are nonsense, so just be aware that um, it's going to be a thing that's present. The exceptions will be things like kosher salt, where it's not added at all. The other thing to be mindful of is that it really shouldn't change anything, whether it's regarded as organic or otherwise, because, well, strictly speaking, salt isn't organic anyway, because there's no carbon in it. But more importantly, it's 
for health benefits, there's a good reason to include it. The last thing to talk about is uh, well, the idea of reducing salt intake. We've mentioned all the reasons why you want to have salt, and as a result, the obvious question is, well, if you're trying to remain healthy, and salt is apparently bad for your health, uh, particularly if you're hypertensive, uh, what do you do? You are again might be thinking, well, just take all the salt out, and no, don't do that. You don't want to add as much, sure, but you don't want to take it out entirely. You may want to add, as a general rule of thumb, 1% salt for every whatever units of flour you're using. So for example, if you're adding one pound of flour, you add 1% of one pound. If you're using civilized numbers, if you're using say uh, one kilogram or 500 grams or something like that, you add 1% salt. So that would be between uh, 10 grams and five grams. The key here will be Notice the effect when you do this, so it's worth keeping a record of what you've done, and you'll find if there's, say, no noticeable effect on the taste, you might be able to lower it again, or if there is an appreciable effect, you might want to bring it back up a little bit, but you'll need to play with the numbers just enough to find the correct balance between reducing it enough that you can eat your bread, or alternatively, enough that, well, you've reduced it enough that you feel that you've made a step in the right direction. There is also, of course, the idea of not consuming bread, but um, we won't speak the heresy here. This is why salt is important in bread. In fact, some of these same features can be applied in other contexts, such as brewing, where salt is fairly important. Of course, it's not just salt that's important in getting the best out of bread, but importantly, having just enough of it. Too much, like most things in life, is bad for you. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.